and generate their own space for the struggle for the defense of their bodies, of their territories. And we must insist that this is a space of an autonomous organization space which is not linked to any political party or any other type of interest related to the private world, the world of corporations. They defend the interests and the needs of uh, rural women, of peasant women. All these years, they have carried out a diagnosis of the situation of women in the rural areas of Nicaragua, and they have found that the situation of poverty, exclusion, violence, rape, and even incest are situations that the women from rural areas in Nicaragua share. Women have been left only in the areas of uh, care, in the domestic areas, and they've been excluded of the spaces of decision and economic administration. They have no access to land, and they have been excluded in general. FEM works on three strategic axes. This is just a brief introduction uh, to the presentations of Rosibel and Kenya. They work in the ideological framework for the empowering of women and their families. They also work on uh, economic access for the generation of uh, income that allow them to improve the living conditions and also emancipate from the control of men from the patriarchy, economic patriarchy. And they also work in uh, organization, creating networks, um, creating cooperatives and also working with agroecology even in the area of communication and dissemination. Rosibel and Kenya are going to be speaking about this and many more about all the work they have been carrying out in the last 25 years. Rosibel Ramos and Kenya Baca, they are two amazing women who have different ages and uh, due to the different generations, they can tell us about the complete history of this organization. I pass the floor over to Rosibel. Thank you very much. Good evening. For me, it is a great pleasure to be here in this conference because sharing this experience is very helpful for me. My name is Rosibel Ramo from San Ramon de Cundela. I am a peasant feminist woman and I come from these processes of action among women. And it's not like, well, I organize myself today and tomorrow I am empowered and tomorrow I'm ready to face all the problems. This is a long process because as we saw in the diagnosis that we carried out at the beginning, there was a lot of work to do. We had many targets and many hurdles because when we started, we were women coming from the countryside. We were women who didn't have a space of our own apart from the kitchen and the house, that was all the space we had. In the diagnosis, we saw that there was a lot of discrimination. There was also a lot of violence, both gender violence and also social violence, physical violence and all kinds of violence. We had to fight for the young girls, for children, for girls, girls who were only 13 years old, but they were already mothers. That was really sad at the beginning. 
we saw this as something natural, but as we started working, following this process, we realized that this was outrageous, what was happening with these young girls, what was happening to the bodies of these girls. So there was this program that was really, really helpful. It was the literacy program. We were women without a face, without a voice. We didn't have any kind of education or training. So we started with the ideological training. That's where we saw, we understood what was going on. So with the literacy programs, we didn't only have to learn to read and write, but this was complemented with uh, gender studies. Then we realized that we were women who had values, who also had the opportunity of learning. Uh, since we were little girls, we had been told that women are not in, were not intelligent, they were no good, and that the only mission of women was becoming mothers and looking after other people. But we realized that it, behind each woman there was a great story, stories of pain, of criminalization, really moving stories and we were we realized that this was the path we had to follow in order to change the realities that is how we decided to teach them to read and write and in 2014 a group of uh, adult women who hadn't had the opportunity of studying when we were little we we acquired uh, qualifications. Sometimes we didn't study because we didn't have the opportunity. On other occasions, it was because it was the male son, the one who had to study because they expected women to marry and to be kept by their husbands. But we decided that that wasn't the path we wanted to follow. We had to acknowledge ourselves, see our own value as women. Before following this process, we just believed what we were told because I knew I was a, a woman because of my genitalia, but I didn't know I was a valuable woman. That was a very capable woman, a woman who could change the situation. And thanks to this process, we chose, first of all, literacy. And I received a, a grant from the foundation between women and other women who studied also got this support and managed to to change the situation and to improve the situations otherwise we would have been just stuck in the spaces that they had uh, told us to be after um, Finishing our secondary education, we decided not to stay there, and I continued studying. After my secondary education, I started studying at university. I studied engineering in processing of natural medicine. Since I was a child, I was very interesting. From my childhood, I was really, really interested in natural medicine. And uh, we had learned a lot from uh, agroecology. Traditionally, we had not been invaded by chemical medicine, and uh, we had a lot of knowledge of traditional medicine. And later, we realized how valuable plants were, and uh, it was we realized it was very important to rescue natural medicine. That's how I came to the university. I, there was a lot of discrimination at the beginning. There were many barriers. And had I not followed this process, 
I wouldn't have been able to finish my studies. Had I not raised my self-esteem, I would not have continued. Because from the moment I enrolled in university, the first thing I saw was, well, a secretary saying, are you enrolling a daughter or a granddaughter? And I say, no, is it forbidden for all women to study? When I was at university, they kept asking me, uh, well, they kept saying, well, he, she works at university, she's going there to clean, because in this patriarchal society, women are only good for cleaning, not for improving themselves. That's why I said to myself, it's worth this struggle, it's worth to keep struggling. At the beginning, I had to unlearn everything that I had learned in my childhood in order to be able to help other women. I could not help other women if I wasn't convinced that I was a subject with rights, that I was valuable, that I had been um, uh, robbed from these uh, rights, that they had been removed from me. And this way we were able to continue with the struggle. We kept fighting for our values and also for other living beings, for agroecology, for everything that surrounds us, for the land. Because we know that the land is really, really valuable for peasant women. That's where production comes from. That's where we can get our empowerment because it's women. Women are the ones who are landless. Those that are made um, invisible for being women. In our countries, land is in the hands of men. Very few women are landowners and they have uh, attained a piece of land. is thanks to our struggle, thanks to our organization. But there's no programs, state public programs that um, provide uh, land to women because the state wants women to be invisible, to be subordinate, to be tied. But we decided to fight. And we proved, we proved that we could attain all these things. Now, we are women who have studied, we have our piece of land, we are women who are thinking of changing our lives, because there is only one life. How do we defend life? We defend it by defending our bodies, our territories, our identities, and also defending everything that surrounds us, such as water, land, animals, the environment, because we live from them. And we don't only, we need to do more than just exploit it. We have a cooperative, but our cooperative is not just, doesn't only aim to exploit the, the land. We, we don't want to sell the products from the land the way the big companies do. Because big companies pollute the water, discriminate nature, and so on. With our cooperatives, we want to, to create a win-win situation. We want to win ourselves, we want to earn money, but we also want nature to win. We want what's good for nature. We want to defend our principles in order to have a full, safe life. And the struggle is that we want to have a life without violence. Because violence is not that easy to eradicate. We're not that many women fighting for this. We need politicians, women in politics, women representatives, 
However, this is just a fight carried out by small women, by women from the grassroots that have realized that they have to fight for these rights. We have uh, changed the situation a bit, but we are sad because realized that the women who are not in these organizations are in the same situation that we used to be. Many women are suffering from violence. Women do not have their lands. We have uh, children who are 13, 14 year old girls who have become mothers. They don't have any more opportunities. They can't study. These girls are not prepared. Their bodies are not prepared to have a child or their mind and it's not prepared to study. They also become irresponsible parents. The fathers do not uh, take responsibility for their acts. They just make the girls pregnant and they don't take responsibility. There are many women who need changes, need support, and we must raise awareness in this country to make sure that these women realize that they can change their lives. It is not easy to reach every woman in this country, but uh, we want to convey all our work, inform them about our work, and we can reach many more women. That is our struggle. We want to have the land, we want to be free from violence, we want to have a life with healthy products, we want healthy food, we want to have uh, food security, we don't want to eat pollution, because if we don't have our own healthy products, we're going to eat uh, processed food, chemicals, um, at the end of the day, well, you, you become ill, where do I get this cancer from? Well, it's because this processed food, little by little, is killing us. Everything that there's a lot of poison thrown to the soil and we're, that is killing us. And that's why we're fighting for agroecology and for healthy food. We want healthy pr products uh, to be sold. We want to sell healthy products, not poison. Rosibel, you're so clear, you're so lucid, you're so enlightened. I want to inform you that the FEM, the Foundation Between Women, originated the cooperative uh, central, which is called the uh, goddesses, that gr groups women who are farmers who produce uh, uh, food and it's also a feminist organization. We have 420 women from eight cooperatives uh, that are included in this cooperative central. Your example is absolutely wonderful. I hope that the people who are listening to us find this as inspiring as I find it. I, by my, my chest is just, I get incredibly inspired when I listen to you. Thank you for being here, sharing your experience and your work. I know that, Rosibel, you had some some pictures with you. I have a picture, yes. If we can, if we can share some pictures, that would be very Si pudiéramos eh, compartir imágenes, sería estupendo. In order to complement your presentation, it would be good to be able to share these pictures. Now we can see the pictures. Maybe you could say a few words about the pictures we're showing. This picture, you can see that, is that during the COVID crisis, I was teaching some workshops to the women from the communities, telling them about the 
prevention of COVID, about medicinal plants, the hand washing and everything that has to be done to prevent COVID. I went to 22 communities sharing this knowledge. That is the market where our products are sold because we have the formal market and we have the informal market. The informal market Well, the formal market is the supermarkets. That's when I, I finished my secondary education. That's my grandson. Those are the workshops. I'm presenting my products here, the products of the goddesses. That was also there, yes. That's at the university. I was doing some, um, well, some practical work. That's also um, delivering the workshops. That's also at the university. I think that now that we're, we're seeing the same pictures, yes. The example of Rosibel, who represents this struggle. It is a great example, very inspiring for other women and it's empowering for women the world over. There are many differences between our countries, particularly between uh, some countries from the south and countries from the north. Listening that uh, women who are 13 years old are raped, uh, that is really, these situations don't happen in the northern countries any, anymore or very, very rarely. It is quite shocking for northern countries. So it's very important that everybody knows about this discrimination that the original peoples of the world have suffered. And uh, the world must know that uh, these peoples are still living this situation. Would you like to add anything else? You can say that at the end. And now we're going to give the floor over to Kenya. Good evening. Thank you very much for sh showing interest in the activities we're carrying out in the countryside as uh, peasant women. We're also very grateful to be a part of this international conference of agroecology. My name is Kenya. I live in Rosario in the municipality of Pueblo Nuevo, in the north of Nicaragua. Since I was a child, I have been participated in a process has, that has been promoted by the in Between Women Foundation. Together with my mother, I participated in this ideological process that is promoted by the Between Women Foundation. I was very interested in the part of the ideological processes. As we know, there's many taboo subjects in school, menstruation, sexual and reproductive health. All these sexist male chauvinistic stereotypes in the rural areas marked my life, my history as a child. In these ideological processes, I, I became involved. I fell in love with these processes. I am the result of foundation between women. I am the product of a foundation between women. I decided not to stay at home. My mother is a great example to follow because she used to come to the workshops and when she 
came back home, all the problems started. There was a lot of conflict because she was participating in an ideological process. I used to live with a very male chauvinistic uh, father and brother. So it was very difficult to transform this. For, for him, it was a woman who uh, was doing the things that she shouldn't be doing. And he believed that her place should be the kitchen and she shouldn't participate in ideological processes that transformed her life. So my mother didn't give up her fight. She continued her struggle. And we started producing hibiscus, which was her first source of income. All these processes opened our lives. They opened my life as a peasant. And we managed to, um, well, live and intermediate, talk with the families in order to try to change this male chauvinism. We started producing the hibiscus flower, and instead of taking away things from him, this was another source of income. And my mother started taking decisions concerning this source of income. So things are changing. Now my father is helping my mother, helps um, cutting the hibiscus flowers, he makes coffee, some things have changed, so our lives have changed. In this, within, proce within this process, I decided to study primary and secondary education. I be was part of a group of youngsters who received um, a grant from the government in order to be able to study. In the countryside, it is not easy to to study. There's so many, so much male chauvinism. They don't want us to go to the city because the city is dangerous. There's drugs. There's male chauvinism, and so on. So it was uh, very challenging, but for me, it was a great, great source of joy to study at university, even though there was discrimination because uh, coming from the countryside, from rural areas, uh, my classmates didn't want to sit next to me. Uh, there was a lot of uh, discrimination. They thought I was like a, a really, I don't know, not sophisticated enough. It is difficult to cope with this. But the ideological processes helped me a lot to, to take decisions to live with this uh, discrimination, to cope with it. So I paid a lot of attention. I didn't pay much attention to the sexism I found in university, but I focused on my studies. And now my profession is I am a sociology graduate. I finished my studies three years ago. And now I am helping other peasant women in foundation between women. I am providing my knowledge. And for me, it's a, an enormous satisfaction being able to help other people. I am in the countryside, I am in the community, helping young women who are suffering violence. I am part of a network of uh, community defenders. We identify problems and violence in the community, and we give support to women very quickly. And if we have to go to the courts or to the police and pretend to be their relatives, we do it because we are fighting to eradicate this violence that the peasant women suffer.
I also form part of an organization of native seeds in my community and we sow the seeds and then we use the seeds that we have been offered to preserve and conserve so we don't lose those native seeds because we are against genetically modified food. We are against our communities being invaded with these with these products that are going to come and destroy and those technological products and packet, packages that are going to destroy our native seeds. So we have a reservoir of native seeds and eight of us women form part of this committee. And if there is any surplus, if there is any surplus, then we give that to the farmers, to the producers and they they give us the characteristics of the seeds that we want. And so we have a very strong leadership in the community. I also form part of a network of communicators. There are 12 of us. We offer programs of advocacy based on thematics. And also we work together as women. We are raising our voice, the, raising the struggle of women of women who are still beginning that process, but that work is beginning and people are beginning to listen to us because we have got quite a lot of impact. And also through these processes, I was able to enter into a, a school, a school for biointensive kitchen garden processes and this led me to feel a little bit disappointed a bit sad because I had nowhere to implement my practices for th this kind of biointensive farming and so in the house we had this huge farm but it was really a kind of rubbish dump for the other houses so I spoke to my father and I said, listen, I have to do these tasks. I have nowhere to do that. I want to produce organically. And I'd like it if in the family we could eat healthy products. I don't want us to, to be people who are consuming contaminated goods because this damages our health and the environment. So I spoke to my father and it made an impact on him, this talk of healthy of eating healthy and so I managed to get that plot of land and so I have a wonderful vegetable garden there. I have a diversification of corn, many other products as well, onion, wheat, now I'm harvesting potatoes and hibiscus flowers and so if you have to make any kind of decision about harvest or selling the surplus my father is asking me, you know, are you going to sell this or are you going to keep this for the household? He knows why I'm making the decisions that I make. So that that garden, that plot of land has also enabled us to change the life of my siblings and to change that inequality that was there in the family because now they help me to irrigate the plot of land if we have to harvest the hibiscus flowers, then they're there working as well with me. As a family, we're working, we're irrigating, we're cleaning the land if we have to, together. And this is real enjoyment because I'm a young woman who's not facing violence. I'm a young woman who's connected through love with agroecology because I don't have any bruises or because I'm not facing any discrimination, there's nothing creating an obstacle to me to be able to connect freely with the plants, with the tomatoes. Sometimes I start in the morning and then I, I, I don't realize that I've spent hours and hours there in the, in the, on the plot of land because I love it so much. So these ideological processes as well, they help me to connect with the land too. All of these struggles, really fill me with satisfaction when I can share that with my family, when I can share that with my siblings and know that they get up and they also 
do the work in the household, the, the family work as well. And I, I know that we can help other peasant women as well. We're working on that struggle. I also form part of a network of agroecological promoters who offer technical assistance to women who have their biointensive plots of land, who also cultivate hibiscus flowers. I'm, I'm also working with beehives and I like to enjoy that. I like to add feed there. I like to see how this organization that the beehives have, how that works. I like to see that. And together with my family as well, we've been able to continue to work and continue to struggle because each process that we experience fills us with satisfaction. For example, er eradicating this male chauvinism that we've been seeing in the household, for me, this is a huge joy because I remember many years ago now, my father bought a plot of land, a farm, and when he came home, he had put everything under his own name. So my mum asked him how the deed had been left. And he said, everything was under my name. And he said, no, 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 tomorrow we're going to change that deed. We're going to change the name on that deed. So he brought it and we changed the deed. Then they bought another plot of land. And as that had happened before, then he just bought the next plot of land only under her name. So we're producing coffee, organic coffee on that farm and we're selling it nationally and internationally within the cooperative of Las Diosas, the goddesses. So we're fighting with other women for access to land to be able to mediate and participate and acquire our own plots of land because for us, for peasant women, the, the fight to have our own autonomy, independence, our own land, it means a lot. We're women who come from the, the kitchen stoves, we're trapped in our homes and we have so many women who are illiterate, so many women who have been abused and we can see how many women have been facing violence because they're not independent. So for us to emphasize this struggle for the fight for land, what it means is to use our own resources, our own goods. It also enables us to be independent women, women who can decide on what they want to plant in their on their plots of land. If, they, if I want it to be organic, these are all decisions that we can have if we have our own land because beforehand, we saw how husbands would buy certain items for their, their wives and that happened because women didn't have their own money. But now, for example, I am the one who decides on the income that I myself am making. So all of these processes that we've been going through as young women this makes us different. The generation of Rossi Bell was one and my generation is different. She has had some difficulties, I've had other difficulties. She's ha been facing different discrimination in university. But all of these examples of the development committee, which is the highest authority, which is made up of peasant women who founded this organization, this gives us energy and motivates us to continue to eradicate all of those sexist stereotypes, to stop the violence and eradicate it because not everything has been resolved in the countryside. What we've managed to achieve is that women can serve their own food because beforehand it was the women who made the food, but men didn't like to go and serve themselves food, women had to do it. So now what we've made, what we've been able to achieve is that men go and serve themselves their own food. They've learned how to make the tortilla, which is part of our daily meals here in Nicaragua, but 
usually if women aren't there, the tortillas aren't made, but we're really fighting to make sure that our brothers, our fathers learn how to make tortillas. They help us with the tasks in the household, like washing clothes and so on, but we are still lacking in some areas and we need to work on that. So we have that mediation. We are there as other young women fighting for access to land, to eliminate the rates of violence and to stop all these kinds of stereotypes. We're supporting other women who, who need our support. We also need to support other women who don't have organizations to, to go to who are still facing so much violence and discrimination. We need to be agents of change in other communities. We also need to, we need to fight to continue to promote our native seeds and to eliminate the genetically modified seeds that are going to destroy our health and damage our health. We women have to be more independent in terms of food as well. We have to be able to produce our own food and not depend on the large corporations. Thank you. We fight for food sovereignty. Yeah. Yeah, we're fighting in our territories, in our communities, in our plots of land, our allotments. We are implementing agroecology, our peasant roots. We are seeing how young women are doing in the countryside because the first thing they do is to emigrate. They go to another country or they go to the large transnational companies to work. And we're working with our beehives, with the hibiscus flower, with basic grains, with coffee. We have a huge project right now, which is on, in terms of entrepreneurship, where women are selling eggs from their hens, or women from pig farms are selling their products. They are selling garments. They're selling different things and providing different products that we need. For example, we have many bakeries and the other companies, the bread from other companies don't reach us because we are consuming homemade food, homemade bread. So we still have to continue working. Of course, absolutely, Kenya. No doubt. You truly represent an immense force for transformation. Please can you silence the microphone just a second? Thank you very much. Undoubtedly, you offer a great force for transformation. It's an admirable, admirable example of struggle. Kenya, who from 13 years old began to organize these actions, and Rossi Bell, who for her part, aged 60 years old, graduating from university, both exceptional leaders. We are extremely fortunate to be able to hear of your experience. I have to say that I can't wait to go and work with you and hear from more experiences. It's, a, it's really comprehensive work. You're working on many different fronts. And all of those fronts fill our hearts. And um, we can see that you are women who, despite the challenges that you face in your daily lives and your work, we can see you as satisfied and happy women because you're doing what moves you and that's the commitment of your heart. So having said this, if you agree, maybe we can move on now to the questions that some of our audience have for you. No photos? It's, you're true. You're right. Yes, we're missing the photos. Sorry, Vince. My mistake. I forgot about the photos. Sorry. Kenya, remember to switch on your microphone to comment on the photos. Thanks.
It looks like these are the photos of Rosibel. Las fotos son las fotos de Rosibel. This is, this is for one of the gatherings that we had of women here and promoting a campaign called Doña Justa, which is for healthy eating. And this is all about selling healthy foods, but it's also about being fair with the land, with ecology and with the, the goods that we have around us. I'm here as a facilitator of some processes where I was offering ideological activities for some young women. These are products from my intensive vegetable garden. Here we have some onions. And here I am cutting and harvesting hibiscus flower. Master of Ceremony of some of the different activities for training of women. And now they're repeating again, it looks like. So now we can move on to the questions. That's my home. Lovely photo of Kenya. Thank you. Sowing corn with my auntie and my mother. Did we have a lot of interest from the audience? We have some questions. We have some 12 minutes left. If we don't manage to answer all of the questions in the time we have left, we'll move on to another session. Carla, who is a volunteer, is going to be helping us with the translation. So the first question for you is, what was the process to, get, to gain land for the cooperative? And what are the experiences of different women to have access to land and means of production? Well, the process for obtaining land was, first of all, well, first of all, women didn't have land, no knowledge. So they said, what would women need land for? And so to demonstrate and see if we as collectives could gain land, we began with a collective of women. And then with a donation, we managed to buy land for that collective. And that's where we began to sow seeds. We sowed different kinds of beans and basic grains. Because first of all, they said to us, what would women want land for? Women don't work on the land women work in the kitchens. But when they saw that we could demonstrate that we could really work the land, processes began to be followed. So after the collective, by training adults, women were helped. And one of the criteria was that illiterate women were able to negotiate a small area of land. And their husbands, their brothers and so on asked them why they wanted that and they said they wanted it be, to be able to experiment and when they saw that they were able to work on that land then some women through management, through communication, they managed to gain their own area of land. This was also done by raising awareness. But it's also unfortunate because there are very few women who have land. All other women don't have land. And to be able to work economically or 
for us women to really feel that that we can become independent, we need that land. Do you want to add anything, Kenya? We're working on a platform to fight for access to land. And in our country, there is a law for access to land, which is the which is law 717. This law doesn't have This law is something that is being demanded. And some women have managed to have to gain their land through agrarian reform. And also within the organization, some women have been able to gain access to land through cooperations that have supported us because we've seen that it's a fundamental element that peasant farmers can produce and be owners of our own land because it's not the same thing to have land which is in the name of my father, in the name of my partner, in the name of my brother. It's not the same as having land which belongs to me and is under my name. So we're still working on this struggle. And young women have also been fighting for peasant farmers and through that some young women have been gain, gaining access to land, growing basic grains, hibiscus flour, coffee. Great, thank you very much for your answer. When you're talking about the cooperation, are you talking about international cooperation? Yeah. In this regard, we have another question, which says that some, are some of some of the areas of land property of the cooperative, or are they bought privately, or perhaps there is a mixed format? Perhaps you could go into that. And this same person asks, is there a risk that the land will be sold for profit for the construction of housing, for example, how can you protect land to make sure it's always going to be used for agroecological farming? How can you guarantee that the land will be used for the agroecological production of food in the hands of Las Diosas? Well, we think that at this point, having your own area of land, you know, land isn't sold. Because it's been so hard to gain that land, that land shouldn't be sold. And if the, the, these young people manage to, to get this land and have received training, then it's, it's difficult to sell the land. Some women have managed within the processes of support from cooperation, from international cooperation, they've been able to gain areas of land. Some collectives have been helping to achieve areas of land for hibiscus flower. But each peasant woman has been fighting to have their own land, their own individual area of land. And this has made it possible to either access the land or access credit to be able to buy their own land and to be owners of their own land. This has been a long process, a difficult one. It's not been from one day to the next. It's been over a long period of time to gather funds, to sell the harvest and to generate some money and and that and in that way pay for the land. We might run the risks risk of women 
selling other products. Well, as Rossi mentioned, women who benefit from the land are women who form part of women organizations. That's one of the requirements. They are women who are part of the ideological processes of many years, of many decades. So it's not just any woman who gains access to land. It has to be a woman who is aware, who is experiencing the ideological, economic and, and other principles that the organization has been promoting. That is one of the parameters for gaining access to land. And women have been trained in agroecological farming and they are really motivated in terms of growing on that land and in gaining an income and people who are very motivated in terms of agroecological production. They are very aware of of what food security and food sovereignty is all about. And the cooperative, the grassroots cooperative in each territory, the central cooperative guarantees this technical assistance in the countryside. And the sale of the processing of the products. So women who are given land aren't left alone the agroecological promoters are there to help them. We also have the women who are leaders of the community visiting them. We also have technical assistance to see what kind of income they're making, what they what seeds they're sowing, how their land is doing. They're not left alone to fend for themselves. So people won't really end up sowing seeds for any other kind of profit or any other kind of purses. We can see that women are embracing that land that they're given. They treat it with care. And we can see how they work on that as a family as well. Great, thank you very much for your very clear answers. We'll move on to the next space because we're running out of time now in this session. So we'd like to invite all of the participants to accompany us because we have some more very interesting questions and we'll be able to go into more detail there in the next session in our conversation. And you can find out more about the experience of Rosibel in Kenya. So if you can go to the link that is being shared now. Thank you very much. And we'll see one another on Zoom, okay? Thank you very much. You just have to click on the link in the chat box. Thank you very much.